Okay, everybody. Episode 47, Weightlifting Life Podcast. We're back once again. Finally, I don't even know how long it's been, but it's been a really long time. It has not been. Again, send your complaints about the times between episodes to Ursula since it is her fault. Uh, I realized the last couple episodes I've forgotten to tell people where they can send questions, and I keep getting a bunch of emails asking where you can send questions. CatalystAthletics.com slash podcast. There is a form to submit questions. They will go right to me. And then I can decide to use them or ignore them or store them for later use. Um, yeah, what else? Oh, go and go and review the podcast if you have a spare moment and you like us. iTunes, Google Play, whatever you listen to that has a review function, we'd appreciate it. And then finally, on my end, we'll see if Ursula has any news. But uh, if you're listening to this in real time, um, go to shop.catalystathletics.com and you can get my new jerk error correction manual for 10 bucks off as a pre-order. So if you get it before it comes out, you get 10 bucks off. Otherwise you got to pull pay full price, just like a normal human being, no special privileges. And there's anyone in the world that does not need that. Um, I mean, my jerk is perfect, but I've never missed a jerk in my life. Oh, well, good for you. Except for the time Ursula was coaching me at an American Open, and I missed two out of three. Has in, nothing to in, do with it. Including me. my opener. Guess who was on the platform? And I wasn't blaming you. I was just, I was, <laughs> you sound a little Saying defensive, I, as if you feel guilty and responsible for my misses. No, I, have, I do, do never. You implied that yourself. No. no. I know I'm saying that everybody knows that everybody needs, knows somebody who needs jerk work? Yeah. Yes. Everybody, there's no one that does it. And that's not for, there's somebody in every gym in this country needs jerk work. Yep. Like it's just a given. Like there are those people who pick up the jerk really quickly, easily. And then there's the other 99% of us that hate those, that 1%. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Stupid Basically. idiots. Yeah, fuck them. <sighs> like they grind out of cleans and you're like, no way, no way. And they go, bloop. And yeah. You just jerk it. And you're like, what the fuck? That that will yeah. always, to the my dying day, be something that I, I cannot understand. I can't how my how my someone can find jerks so easy and consistent, but can't figure out how to do cleans. I, I don't understand it. Like from an intellectual standpoint, like the clean to me is the easiest thing on earth. Yeah, it is. Besides like a deadlift. It is. But I guess if they're just not as strong, maybe they just look real hard. But I, it, it just it, it <clears throat> always boggles my mind that somebody grinds out of a clean yeah. and then the jerk looks so easy. And you're like, what? Yeah. It, well, I, would, I would have sat there, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just some people get lucky. You get lucky sometimes. Sometimes people are really natural at snatch and you're like, you lucky bastard. And then, you know, they're really lucky, good at, at jerk, you know, like just from the beginning. And I've, you see it over and over where you have just these few people and there's less of them than there are ones that need to work on the jerk. That's why I'm saying the book is a necessity. Yes. There are just far fewer people who are natural and pick up jerk really, really easily. And I'm not just saying light jerks, because we can all do light jerks. Oh, my light jerks. jerks look perfect. That's not the issue. Oh, yeah. No, I'm a light jerk champ. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the heavy jerks that fuck me up. Well, we, did, we just need one of those. They are the ones that matter. Yeah, we just need one of those world championships where it's just style points for 70% clean and jerks. We would crush it. <laughs> totally dominate. Champs. <laughs> world reigning world champs 70% <sighs> undisputed light heavyweight champion of the universe okay uh, I, oh I Ursula <laughs> that's that's what we didn't do we didn't do the pre-flight checklist is your phone unplugged <laughs> Greg and I were already talking for 30 minutes his dogs barked yeah, they they know to bark when we're not recording. They barked, and he was getting his lawn mowed. Oh. Nobody heard all that. No, nope. Did not. Nope. nope. Because nope. I know I know when it's appropriate to do those things and when it's not. Whatever. Okay. Are are you ready? It could have so happened if we had started. 
started recording as soon as we started talking. Tell your secretary to take the damn phone off the hook. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me get to my, let me get to my staff. Hold on. Yeah. Seriously. Right. Your office manager is really blowing it. I'm sending myself a, a, an email right now. <laughs> Don't send an email. You should have an hour long staff meeting for something that could be accomplished in a three sentence email. Oh, I hear yes. I hear that's the the real popular thing to do in, in the executive world. Yeah. I don't actually have a corporation, so Okay. Matter. Well I do, but it's basically just me, so it's kinda stupid. <laughs> you could just send an email to Amy. Yeah, and then she'll send it right back to me. Like here you need to answer this. You should probably print it out. You know, say, what the <laughs> We're having a meeting about put this. Out, in your face. Yeah. Okay. Steps over to you. So this is very, this is going to be the most exciting episode on earth for Norma Jean because I have kicked her question to the next episode for probably half a dozen episodes. Oh, so we're going to do Norma Jean? We're going to do Norma Jean because she deserves it. She's been sitting there waiting patiently, even though she doesn't know she's been waiting patiently. We're just going to handle this. Norma Jean already doesn't fucking listen to us anymore. (laughs) <laughs> that's very likely, but that's probably that could be said about pretty much anybody who who at one time listened to this podcast, and then they heard it and realized how awful it was. Okay, Norma Jean says, "Greg, please bear with me in my long-winded question. Like a lot of current weightlifters, my introduction to weightlifting began with CrossFit about four years ago." My athletic background is fairly basic. I played volleyball and basketball through middle school and high school. Entering into college was the exit of most of my physical activity. Uh, During my last year of school, I was sick of being out of shape and overweight, and I began CrossFit. Just to provide some perspective, I couldn't hold my body weight hanging from the rig or do a push-up when I started CrossFit. After two years or so of CrossFit, I made made the transition to focus on weightlifting. You're definitely not the only one. Uh, As I'm very new to the sport, please be patient with my observations slash question. Are we ever impatient? Uh, I weight lift with a training partner that has been in the sport quite a while and has a lot of knowledge. He seems to provide good feedback and cues, albeit he does not consider himself my coach and he is not currently programming for me. Over the past year, I constantly hear certain cues and technical corrections that I do my best to adhere to. For example, hips back, bring the bar to your hips and chest up in the jerk. I won't lie, after hearing the same fucking corrections so often, they just become white noise. Like, bro, I'm fucking trying. (laughs) Uh, Here's where I'm going with this. Setting aside the fact that I'm new and my lifts are going are going to basically be trash for a long time. That's the spirit, <laughs> Norma Jean. Yeah. Uh, at, at, at what point are these? Confidence here. Yeah. At what point are these uh, cues technique issues or strength issue? There have been people over time that roll into weightlifting with these monster athletic backgrounds that set them up for pretty significant sex, uh, success in weightlifting. Uh, e.g. Maddie Rogers, former gymnast. I know of former collegiate track athletes that the first time they touch a barbell, they can practically strict press my best jerk. There's obviously a major correlation between foundational strength and success in weightlifting. Uh, At what point do you take a major step back from the barbell and work on building the athletes all around strength? Or does this strength happen inherently from just weightlifting and minimal accessories? I'm not trying to discount the importance of technique, but after hearing keep the bar close one billion times, maybe I'm just not fucking strong enough to keep it close because I swear to God I'm trying here. So my questions are, do you pull athletes away from the clean and jerk and snatch significantly to build strength? If so, what does that programming look like? Or as I stated earlier, does this strength build inherently from just weightlifting and minimal to moderate accessories? Whew, Norma Jean, we did it. We got through that question together. I feel like we really have something special now. Uh, so th- to me, this is, this is like, there are multiple issues going on here. Um, so I would just want to address the first one first, which is, bro, I'm fucking trying the same cue a thousand times. Obviously, isn't working. It's time to move right. on to another one. So that, that's that's one thing. As a coach, um, if you say the same cue a million times and you do not get the response to it ever that you're looking for, you got to try something different. And to be fair to this guy, he's not a coach. He doesn't claim to be a coach. Um, but just for the coaches out there who are doing the same thing, we've all done it. I've done it. Um, I'm Ursula probably hasn't done it, but, uh, you know, eventually you got to realize like, Hey, this athlete does not understand what I'm saying. So repeating it louder is not going to help. 
Uh, it's like those fucking morons who just talk louder to people who don't speak English. Oh, well, they got it now. Thank God you figured out the problem, you fucking idiot. Um, so that's number yeah, one. Yeah, that's what he's doing. He's but, yelling the cue. Yeah. <laughs> Hips back, idiot. Uh, so that aside now, between technique and strength, you need both, Norma Jean, and they, they need to... Uh, they need to align with each other. So you have to have the postural strength. Strength is very specific to positions and motions. So you have to have that specific strength to support the technique you need. So in that you are correct. Um, but something like keeping the bar close, mm -hmm. I would be disinclined to attribute that to a lack of strength. Um, how you're standing with the yeah because the, the easiest way to keep a bar closer to you is to not put your shoulders farther in front of the bar and putting your shoulders farther in front of the bar requires more strength than having them farther back um, so in that particular case I would I would say no it's it's very likely not a strength issue that doesn't mean you don't need to get stronger. You very likely do. You in a couple of years ago, you saying you couldn't do a push up and couldn't hang from the bar. You probably still need a lot of strength work. Every weightlifter needs strength work. Um, but what I would say, and I'm sure Ursula will go into more detail on this, is uh, in your position now, which is I think the case for the vast majority of uh, people who are coming to this sport uh, as adults without big athletic backgrounds or at least without athletic backgrounds that are similar enough to weightlifting to provide a lot of carryover you got to do everything at once you don't have the luxury of being you know picked off a farm at the age of seven having the size of your balls checked for suitability for weightlifting uh, all that kind of stuff and then being put through the different phases of training to perfectly align with the biological development of your body uh, you got to kind of do it all together uh, Ursula yeah. What do you What do you think? I mean, I, and obviously, I agree. I, I think that there, kind of, sometimes the coaches will feel like the easy answer for not teaching technique is just to get the athlete stronger. So then they get sh still technically shitty lifts, um, and still under what the athlete athlete would do if they were technically more proficient. So I, I don't. I wouldn't go straight there for the answer. This is one of the things that she said she can't do in terms of the, the cueing and the I agree, obviously, with cues. If they're not eliciting the response that you want, then it's a useless cue. You need to find something else. Um, but it sounds to me like when she gives these examples, probably, I would assume, examples of cues that she's heard, somebody needs to just teach her how to pull first. Yeah. Like if she can't keep the bar close, it, it shouldn't be that effortful in terms of strength to keep the bar closed. Well, and you can't it's teach technique with cues. No, you have to break down and teach technique with actual exercises. So it sounds to me like, I mean, specifically learning how to stand uh, from the knee to the hip, I would do quite a bit of, of pulling from a block right at the knee or right above the knee uh, so that the bar starts there and learn how to stand with the bar so that the bar stays close. And she could be, like you said, with her shoulders so far over the bar that when she starts pulling, the bar swings away. And that's why she feels like it's it's a strength issue, that she has to use her lats correct uh, a lot. But you really shouldn't feel them a lot. I mean, the engagement of the lat changes as you're standing. It's not so much right off the floor because your shoulders and hips are moving together. It's a little bit more as you pass your knee because the bar might swing out as you go into a hang position. But from the knee to the hip, the shoulder is really leading the bar where the bar is going. So if you keep raising your hips and go more and more over the bar, of course the bar is going to get away. But if you start standing with the shoulders up and back, the bar should be coming towards you. And so you don't have to take your uh, hips to the bar because the bar comes to your hips because of the way that you're moving. So the bar should come to you because of how you stand with the bar, not because you drive it in there with your lats. And I see a lot of people, they'll be in their hang position at their hip and they're driving the bar back with their lats, those kind of Russian pulls that people do, um, which is fine if you just want to work your lats and load your low back, but it's not actually how you pull when you snatch. And I think that's the one thing that people don't understand about that. There are a lot of athletes that do those types of pulls 
but nobody at their hip is still way over the bar when they go to jump. The shoulders are, are either aligned or a little bit behind the bar when you actually go into flight. You're moving through those positions, but with your shoulders over the bar, with the bar in your hip, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Those pulls that people do where they straighten out their knee a lot, they pull the bar into their hip using their lats and the shoulders are still way in front. Yeah. I see a lot of people using those pulls. That's not technically how you're pulling in the middle of a snatch. That's a strength exercise for the low back and lat uh, in the pool that uses those muscle groups more as you're standing. You never get a fully open hip on those, and you do in a snatch. So um, I have a feeling maybe some of that might be going on, and and so they're really trying to well, teach her to bring the bar to her hip, but they're not teaching. Maybe she's not learning a correct pull. Yeah, because it, it's, her example is hips back, bring the bar to your hips. Right, and it he, sounds that's, like that Russian. Pull yeah, pull which yeah. Uh, I, I I'll say this every single time. I wrote an article about this one time. It is very possible to push the bar too far back in your pull. You get way back on your heels. Your hips are back. You, you tuck the bar back into your hips while your hips are way behind your feet. You're, it's way too far back. You cannot extend completely. Or if you try, you're basically, you have all this distance where you're actually literally pushing the bar forward with your hips the whole time they're extending. And shockingly enough, the result is that the bar goes forward. Well, so just reading that cue and then what she described, I'm seeing this, uh, what you just you know described as, as, what, as what she's possibly trying to do when in fact, really you should just be standing the bar into your hip. And, and as you extend your knee, the bar comes to you. And as you elevate your chest and shoulders, the bar comes to you. And because you're standing, your hips go to the bar simultaneously. Right, so it should. It's that part of it. It's not all about effort. It's that is technical. Yeah. Um, and so, it may be that they're trying. You know, getting stronger can be a band aid for poor technique, and I don't think that's a good idea. In most cases, as Greg mentioned, if you're an adult learning the sport, you're working strength and you're working technique simultaneously because you don't have a lot of time to lose. But the immediate focus when you're learning how to lift should really be technical. And I really don't push strength until some measure of proficiency is there. And so I think that you're getting ahead, like you're giving up on the technical aspect and saying, I'm just going to get strong instead. Um, As if that, and that will help you lift more weight. It will help you lift more weight in the same non-proficient way you were lifting lesser weights, which then lends itself to injury. So I'm not sure that's the fix. Um, I, I, you know, I'm all about getting strong, but I'm more about good technique. And the reason I'm more about good technique is more good technique lends itself to lower injury uh, incidents. And um, well, you don't want to be throwing weights over your head and not being able to predict where they're going to land and actually be stronger now so that you can throw heavier weights over your head and not predict where they're going to land. The other, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go, I, the other thing I was looking at was this, you know, in jerk, I mean, you've picked the two technical movements, right, which then tell you, like, if you're having problems with snatch and jerk, but not necessarily with clean, that's a big old blaring red light. That I told you the clean was easiest. Stuff. Yeah, the clean is easiest. It's the least technical of all of them. The pull is easier. You can get away with more errors um, without as much impact because of the the lack of necessary uh, accuracy that you would have in the snatch where you have a very small uh, margin of error in catching the bar and being able to stand up. In the clean, you can get away with a lot. And um, that usually is the exercise that demonstrates strength. So if you're not having problems with your clean, but you are having problems with your snatch and your jerk, that lends itself immediately to this is probably technical. Yeah. Um, as a as a result, I, and I'm not the biggest fan. I every every uh, seminar of any sort that I teach, one of the questions always is, "What's the cue for that?" Yeah. Everybody wants cues as answers. Cues can help, but cues aren't the answers. So fixing technique is the answer. Right. People so, have to understand that you you don't teach with cues. Cues are reminders to the athlete of what you've already taught them. Right. They, they have to, they're basically shorthand references 
to the longhand lessons. So if, if they don't already know those things, then you're basically reminding them of something they don't understand yet, which is pointless. But going back well, to she what she doesn't understand how to keep the bar closed. That's what she's I'm saying. So it doesn't her matter. Bar closed the whole time, right? Telling her to keep the bar closed is is getting the same result every single time. He nobody's taught her how to keep the bar closed when she stands. Right. And I would go back to that, like. To but keep- so going back to what you were saying about emphasizing technique um, instead of just trying to you know put the the strength band aid on it. The other point, though, is that if you the, the better your technique is with the lifts, the more accurate your technique with the supporting strength exercises is going to be, which means the more it's going to carry over into the snatch and clean and jerk. So, for example, if you don't know how to pull uh, a snatch you know, from the floor to the hip and then you go do a bunch of you know snatch deadlifts or variations of snatch pulls and all those things to get stronger in that it's very unlikely you're going to be doing them uh, as correctly as you should be, which means that you're basically just going to strengthen that improper movement and make it harder and harder and harder to get better uh, technically. So if if you have that technical um, development kind of leading the way, that means that all that supporting strength work that you're doing is going to better support the technique work that you're doing. So it, it kind of... you. You really have to do it in that order. Um, You know, we see, I I know, Ursula, you'd see this too, people who come in with, um, you know, kind of this this high level of strength in a very general sense. Like, well, I can squat a lot. I can deadlift a lot. But it's like the carryover to the actual snatch and clean and jerk is shockingly fractional because they're strong in these positions that do not work for the snatch and clean and jerk. Um, so again, that's why it's so important that when you're doing supportive strength work for the lifts, you're doing it with the exact same balance and posture, uh, and timing and motion that you would be, uh, for the lift it's supporting, you know, so your poles look exactly like how you're supposed to pull a snatch or a clean, Mm -hmm. uh, your, your jerk dip squats look exactly like you would dip in the jerk, you know, whatever the case is. Uh, because if you're not doing that again, you're, you're, you're literally making it more difficult, um, by strengthening those incorrect movement patterns and and postures. So, uh, well, and I put a little note down here for myself as you were saying all of that and, and it's, but I put poor technique means less transfer to the lift. So your technique is how you, your technical proficiency is important because it's how you get forced to the bar. Right. So you can have, as Greg was saying, a, the ability to generate a lot of force, but you can leak a lot of energy as you're trying to get it to the bar because you don't have good technique. So sometimes getting stronger will have little to no impact on how much you improve in your actual lifts. Because if the technique is not such that you can get that force to the bar, then it, it, you can keep getting stronger and, and not see the proper amount of transfer of that strength in terms of being applied to the actual movements. So you just end up with a bigger gap between your lifts and your squats and pulls. And and absolutely agree, especially with beginners, the movements that you're teaching in terms of pulls and squats should mimic what they're doing in the lifts. You get further down the road and people start doing specialized types of pulls that's fine. That's great. Uh, you can, you know, do different movement patterns in the pools and add different exercises that are focusing on strengthening certain parts of certain muscle groups that you use in the pool. But the immediate pool that you teach should be the same movement that you want them to use in the actual snatch. And that's why it's seeing a lot of new athletes do those Russian style pulls when you don't even know how to do a regular pull yet is mind blowing to me. It's like, why are you doing that? You snatch like shit still. You need to do a pull that looks like the pull you're going to do in your snatch. And that's not it. You're not impressing anybody with fancy moves. You should be directing all of your initial work towards what is going to reinforce the technique that I want for the, the lifts themselves. And then you can, you know, later down the road work on, oh, I need to get my low back specifically stronger or my glutes and hamstrings. 
And I'm not saying you can't do any work on them. I'm saying the pools that you select to do should relate specifically back to the lift. And I think that was the same thing you were saying. I'm just, now I'm just saying it louder. <laughs> I like what you said. I'm going to say it loud. That's, that's pretty much this whole show is one of us says something and the other one just parrots it louder. even more fervently. <laughs> yes, that is correct. In case you guys didn't hear it five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. In case you didn't understand Gre- understand Greg's English, which is truly better than mine. Um, so if you, speak, you know, you know what we should you know, do. If you speak poor English, then listen to me. If you speak elevated, very correct English, you should listen to Greg. Uh, yeah, what, should we do? what we should do is the the first one of us should teach the lesson, and then the second one should just reinforce it with cues. <laughs> Just, just to you know, reinforce that whole lesson. Uh, okay, are we ready? Are we ready to take on this Gwen question? Oh, uh, I don't know. Are you ready for me? I don't. I don't I think so. But I don't. Greg told me had to make this short. You know what? Don't try to make me sound like some bad guy, like abusive husband who's trying to tell you to shut up. No, you said make. It short. <laughs> you, you, I'm just I mean, saying we can't talk about this for an hour. Oh, I'm not letting you answer it. Come on. Jesus, Ursula. I, I'm surprised you even picked it because you probably picked it very loathingly. Do you, do you know why I picked it? It's because we've been getting these questions for the past how many months? And if we don't answer it, there will be a full scale revolt. You know what I didn't tell you? Did you know the 2020 Junior Worlds is going to be in Cairo? I did not. Is it going to be under one of the pyramids? That's what I'm hoping for. That would be on sweet. Top. On top just, might be tricky. Yeah, they should, well, they should just clear, you know, just cut one in half and turn it into a venue. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, that. They can use the other the, ones the, around. The Great the Skylight Pyramid. pyramid. <laughs> it'll be like, it'll be, they'll turn it into the, the Louvre. Skylight. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's, let's take care of this once and for all. Uh, Gwen and a thousand other of you said, I would love to hear you discuss the new weight classes. Ursula, could you talk about the rationale behind the new weight classes? <laughs> I would also be interested in the history of changes and when you think they will change again. <laughs> oh, there's Let's just the first one first. so many things in there. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. The first men's weight classes were 56, 60, 67 and a half, 75. 82.5, 90, 100, 110, 110 plus. Is that 10? 1, 2, 3, 4. What am I missing? Oh, the 52s. They started at 52s. So the first men's classes, historically, that I know about, so this only this just goes back to the 80s. Oh, it goes back further than that, but I know that there have been some other weight class changes at some other point. But for most of our living history, at least mine. Uh, 52 was the men's. 56, 60, 67 and a half, 75, 82 and a half, 90, 100, 110, 110 plus. So the men originally had 10 classes for for people who, and that was before women were the Olympics. That was before women were invented. <laughs> and then the women started at 44, and I'm doing, writing this as I go along, so I might fuck up. 48, 52, 56, 60, 67 and a half. 75, 83, and 83 plus. Is that 9? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah. So the women had 9. So originally, and I say originally, back the as far back as the history that I know, because when they were talking about weight class changes, they mentioned there had been more than I know about. Um, I know about the original classes when I started competing, and these go back to, I know, like the 50s or so. We had men's 52, 56, 60, 67 and a half, 75, 82 and a half, 90, 100, 110, 110 plus. The women had nine classes when they first were permitted to compete. And the classes created for them were 44, 48, 52, 56, 60, 67 and a half, 75, 83 and 83 plus. And that was for the women starting in the 80s. So that's when we had those classes for the women. That I know, that that I'm aware of. Um, so those are the like the first class I competed in was 56. Did you compete under these classes, Greg? I did not. 
Okay, and I so came then, in like pretty pretty quick after they changed. I think. So then, in 1994, <clears throat> 93, we started, and so they must have come up with them in 92 after the 92 games. Which, where we had th- those classes that I just mentioned. In 93, we started with the new set of classes again. So the men... Oh, shit. I'm not even going to remember. I don't even know if I'm going to remember the men. Do you remember the men? For this last one? What are you talking uh, about? No, no, no. no the, 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 last the early 90s? With, yeah. You know what? I can look at our problem. I don't remember. It, it, the men started at 54. That's all I remember. Um... Well, no. See, I'm I'm remembering the last the the last one before this most recent change. That's the one that had the hundred one ten classes. But I and it was like well, we had a one hundred eight in the ninety three. Was it? Uh huh. I'll I'll look it up real quick because I'll just look up uh, ninety four. I can't believe I forgot. It started in ninety four. Well, no, the one okay, so the one tens were still around at the in the end of the nineties at least. Um, so for at that point uh, in starting in 94 we had um, what did I look up just now this must be juniors or something yeah it is those like classes look low uh, I can go back to the 60s but I don't really care to um, I'm pretty sure the men started it and so the so let me go with the men first since I did it that way uh, uh, we started at 54 and so this is the night starting in in 93 this and I just remember because this was like worlds and I had to be either 54 or 59 uh, men were 54 59 64 this is ringing a bell now 70 76 83 Oh, damn it. Because it was a 91, right? Yeah, it was a 91. I can't go past it. 91. Oh, fuck. 99. 91, 99, 108, 108 plus. Let's see. I mean, it was that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. We still had ten for men and then the nine for women. So again, uh, after starting in 94 or 93, I'm sorry, starting in 93, you had for the men 54, 59, 64, 70, 76, 83, 91, 99, 108, and 108 plus. So, but we went from 10 to 10, and the whole premise there was that we were going to have these new clean classes <laughs> for uh, to set new records in. We cleaned up the Clean sport. Up. We better get Clean new weight classes. Sport. Yes. Yeah. That's why I uh, laughed at her Her last question is, when will they change again? Probably yeah. in six weeks. Let's be honest. <laughs> Stop it. Uh, and then for the women, um, we had starting at 46, 50, 54, 59, 64, 70, 76, 83, and 83 plus. So they aligned with the men's from 54 on. So the men and the women had the same, and the only difference was the women had two earlier or lighter weight classes, and the men had um, four heavier uh, weight classes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, we had nine classes. Uh, So for people who don't understand why we went back to having, I mean, why we went to 10, that was the traditional number uh, that we had in in weight classes. Um, 97, we were still using those, it looks like. Uh, it, was, it was 98 or 99? 98. Here we go. 98, we get new classes again. So that was in 94 as, um, as a response to doping issues. So you had the traditional 10 and 9, then you had a 94, a change, I'm sorry, 93, I keep saying 94, 93, right after the Olympics. We had a change of classes, and I just remember because that World Championships, I went as a 59, and I had gone in 92 as a 56. 
And so then we change again. In 98, women aren't going to be permitted to the Olympics. And because women are permitted into the Olympics, the deal was the men had to drop to eight classes and the women got seven. So they had well, to Well, the, the deal was that the Olympics would only give us 15 medal places, Yeah, they would right? only give us, yeah, so many medals. And if they were only going to give us so many medals, then we had to now change the weight classes to reduce the number of classes of men by two. We, they did a reduction of men by two and men and women by two. So the men went from 10 to eight and the women went uh, from nine to seven. So, uh, you know, in terms of re- reduction, it was a fair reduction. Um, and of course, those are the classes that most of us are familiar with uh, and are used to. And so we have the 52, let's see, one, two, 56. 62, 69, 77, 85, 94, 105, and 105 plus. So those are the classes that we know of today, or we did, um, because of these changes. Oh, look, I won that year. I pulled up some results and I actually won. In 90. <laughs> oh, oh, look what I just happened to find, everybody. Yeah. No, I was just pulling up years that I knew we made the changes to make sure uh. that I had the classes right. Because now there's just so many numbers in my head after yeah. Tashkent too. Well, and you, and you didn't so, you didn't yeah. list the most recent women: 48, 53, 58, 58 63, 69, 69 75, 75, 75 plus. 75. And then we had 90 there for a, one minute. Right. Then we threw in the 90s and made that a 90 plus, and that was our last like oh gen- gender parity for weight classes. And of course, then when we went to the IOC to try to get the 90 added. Um, so for gender parity, which is something that they approve of, they said, oh, yeah, we'll give you gender parity. Um, you don't get eight and eight. You get seven and seven. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. That's gender parity. It's still it's the same. But we're not going to add for you. We're going to take away. Yeah. And so now we had to do the seven and seven Olympic classes. But the decision was to reinstate the traditional 10 classes for each and then reduce to seven just for the Olympics. And that's something we do for the Youth Olympics, many other sports. We're the sport that gets, for a weight class sport, we have the highest number of medals. So oh, really? We have more than wrestling? Mm-hmm. I think oh. they're at like five. five. Oh, I'd have damn. To look it up. That sucks. But yeah, no. There's, there's always the potential that they're going to go back and reduce us by even more. Because other weight class sports. Yeah, they're going to reduce us to zero and zero if we keep no. this shit up. No, they're going to... Uh, reduce us they could reduce us even more in the future you have to kind of at least have the foresight to say do we want to keep reducing the number of classes based on what we get in the olympics or should we kind of do our own thing as a sport um go back to the 10 and 10 and then we can select different classes for the olympics based on uh the olympics uh whatever the ioc allows us to have in in the olympic games and so if there's any further reduction, we don't end up with six weight classes for men and six weight classes for men and then five for men and five. And before you know it, we have three classes apiece um, because there's the potential for reduction. Hopefully it never gets that far along. But to not have the foresight to prepare for it would be um, negligent on the part of those who are making these decisions, I think. So if you look at the current men's categories, uh, There's a 55 now. Well, there was a 52, a 54, and a 56. There is a 61. Well, there used to be a 60. Uh, The analogous would be 64 and 62 from the past. We have had a 67, uh, but it was a 67 and a half. 73 is basically your replacement for some combination of where we used to have a 70 and a 76 when we had 10, the 75s under the original weight classes, and somewhere between the 69s and 77s. Uh, We have the 81 class and an 89 class, which picks up your old 77s, uh, what were 82.5s and 83s in the past. Your 89 is reflective of that 90 and 91 kilo class. Um, You have a 94 that replaces the 96 that we uh, had in our most current classes. And then you have your, basically your super, uh, 
your heavyweight classes, your 105s and your 105 pluses um, are now 109s, 109 pluses, and what used to be in the 10 class scenario, the 100 and the 99 is now a 102. So just a little bit above that. And so we can see kind of a reiteration of the three uh, previous sets of classes reappear in some analogous way in the current classes. Uh, and that's just talking about the full 10. Uh, women, we used to have a 44, we used to have a 46, and it was bumped to 48 when we had to lower. Um, so if you look at the 44 and the 46, in between is that 45 class. Uh, 49s are the analogous class to 48 and, and 50s from the old, uh, when we had 9 and 9. Um, you have a 55, which looks like the old 54, 56. Uh, you have a 59, which actually duplicates the 59s from the 93 classes. Um, you have a 64, which again duplicates uh, what we had in 93. You have a 71, uh, which is just a kilo above what we had in 93. A 76, which again duplicates what we had in 93. So there are three classes in here that have existed before uh, from 93 to 98. Uh, then we have an 81, which is um, this uh, former 83 class. And then somehow we have an 87 and an 87 plus. Don't even get me started. Uh, because we have more heavyweight classes than we've ever had. Uh, in our old nine scenario, we would have uh, eliminated that, right? It would, it would have probably gone 81, 87 or 70 like 87 would have been the plus class because we had 76 83 83 plus so it made sense to go 76 81 81 plus uh, and then put something in the middle in my opinion um, didn't happen that way we actually have more heavyweight classes than we've had in the past for women we start a lower not the lowest we've ever started and we finish higher but um, and not the highest because of the 90 and 90 plus that we just re recently had, but much higher when you look at what we had in the eight in the eighties before and in the uh, 93 to 98 classes where the weight stopped at, at 83 and then went to 83 plus. Um, and what am I saying in the 80 in the, um, sorry, in the before it was for the women, it was 82 and a half and 82 and a half plus. I accidentally wrote 83. God. I don't know if I said that or not. So in the, when I first started competing, we had 44, 48, 52, 56, 66, 7 and a half, 75, 82 and a half, 82 and a half plus, which in the change became 83 and 83 plus. And now it looks like 81, 87, and 87 plus. So you can see that there's, uh, when we got 10 classes, we didn't add to the middle or the front, we added to the end. So there are actually more heavy women's classes now. Um, now, so that's kind of the history of where these classes came from and went to, and we just discussed what classes we have now, which is the one that I know the least. There was an IWF bodyweight categories working group that met May 31st and June 1st um, at 10 o'clock at the Hotel Nemzeti in Budapest, Hungary. Oh my God, this and is so up. specific. What were you wearing? What so did you have for there. breakfast? <laughs> Executive summary. I don't usually eat breakfast at these things because I feel like I'm going to throw up. Executive summary and key recommendations. The technical committee had two representatives, Vlad and Chinin, uh, who's running the Tokyo Olympics, not Niku, but Chinin, uh, Raiko is. Kyle and Avinash Pandu from the research committee. But on the medical committee, you had Dr. Michael Rani and Dr. Mark Gavali. The Sport Program Commission, you had Attila Adalfi, who's our Director General for the IWF, Matthew Curtin, and Tom Gogeberger. 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 <laughs> I don't know how to say his name. <laughs> That's that Belgian uh, Olympian. Anyways, he was the athlete's rep. Um, so they met, and they looked at all sorts of things. They stated their primary purpose uh, was to review and recommend subject matter of IWF committees and the IWF Executive Board to create a new portfolio of IWF bodyweight categories, establish a medal program, a medal event program, so the seven and seven, uh, come up with a method for new world records, Olympic records, and entry totals for the IWF championships. So they went to work, and then they they did all sorts of, uh, and I saw the, the printout, and it was just on the 
the big screen overhead, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of numbers and different. They basically looked at every single combination that they could come up with that made sense because they created a methodology. And let me see where that methodology is. Um, key principles. These were their key principles. Athlete health first. Desire to avoid forced weight loss for competitions. Calculation drawn from linear percentage increase between body weight categories. Um, that's important, I think. That linear percentage increase between body weight categories. Propose shall be proposal shall be simple, easy to understand, with solid reasoning. Um, strategic ambition to future-proof body weight ca categories for many years ahead. Inclusive approach for all, all athletes, so no minimum or maximum body weight limit. Um, no duplication with existing body weight categories as to demonstrate a clean and fresh start. 10 prov uh, provides a poss possibility to extend the categories. However, the higher end shall be more broadened than the lower end. Women's highest category shall be lower than 100. 7 plus 7 will be categories to be drawn from the 10 plus 10. A use of whole numbers, no 0.5 increments. Same methodology to apply to, for both genders and all age groups. Um, and they noted that one perfect solution does not exist, and of course we know that because nobody agrees. Um, but based on uh, these discussions and deliberations, the working group unanimously concluded that increase between body weight categories should be approximately 10% for men's events and 9% for women's events. So if you look at the original, the ones that the Iranians took a picture of when they weren't supposed to and put it on their Instagram, and then later came up to me and asked me, what are the Olympic classes? Yeah, those guys. Um, <laughs> that was the morning of breakfast. The guy came up to me and says, oh, so for the Olympic categories, they did drop out this and that. And I was just like, what are you asking me for? You obviously have the document. You already posted it on Instagram. And he just looked at me and said, oh, and walked off. Um, Bye now. But, huh? So Bye the now. Original categories that, yeah, I was just verifying, thanks. Um, the original categories that we posted then, uh, well, that were posted by the Iranians, and then people started to share. That was actually the only real thing that was ever posted. On uh, that was actually IWF approved at, at some level, and posted were these men: 55, 61, 67, 73, 80, 87, 95, 106, 118, 118 plus. Women. 47, 51, 55, 59, 64, 70, 76, 83, 91, 91 plus. Not what we have now. These were their proposals. Um, and then they had youth and women that were analogous. For Tokyo, the categories they had selected at that point were 61, 67, 73, 80, 87, 106, 118 plus. For the women in Tokyo, 51, 55, 59, 64, 70, 83, and 91 plus. They marked out in a consistent manner the second to the highest weight class and the fourth to the highest weight class. For the men, that 95 class uh, was marked out not because we don't have depth of 95s and they necessarily wanted, but because the IOC had made a direct, uh, given direct uh, instructions that we should. Remember, they initially wanted to pull off the 94s and everybody was losing their mind? Yeah, and they gave us, and we went back and basically begged them to let us just rewrite our own categories. They said, "Okay, you can rewrite your own categories, but don't include a replication of the 94." Well, what is 95 or 96? It's a replication of the 94. So, because we had been given those direct instructions, they had pulled out that fourth highest, which was the 95, and when they pulled out that one, they did the same thing for the women. So everything looked consistent on paper when you look at this original proposed categories for Tokyo. They were pulling out the 95 and the 118, and for uh, the women, or for the women, they were pulling out the 76 and the 91. So those were the original um, proposals that came from this commission, and it between each class, you had uh, an average of a 9% difference in the women's, and the actual differences between 47 and 51 were 8.5%, from 51 to 55, 7.8, 7.27, 455 to 59, and Dalia continues that way. Um, and if you look at the average increment increase, it was 9%. For the men, the average increment increase was 10%. So 
<clears throat> and it looked like 10.9, 9.8, 8.9, 9.5, 8.7, 9.2, 11.5, 11.3. So there was a consistency. And it was um, linear, right? There was this linear increase in kilograms. So you had from 55 to 61, 6, from 61 to 67, 6, from 67 to 73, 6. And then it went 7, 7, 8, 11, 12, right? The differences for the women went 4, 4, 4, 5, 6, 6, 7, 8. So this linear increasement that they were talking about was also applied. So you had an increase in percent that was an average of nine for the men, ten for or nine for the women, ten for the men, and then a linear increasement in kilograms uh, between them. So it was this was after you know this working group met, and in my document that I have, I have all sorts of other information on how they establish. Um, world records and Olympic records and we can talk about that some other time but it, it was very thorough so we get this document the first day of our executive board meetings when we get to Tashkent and what happens well Niku Vlad who's the head of the technical committee in the, and um, is and was on this bodyweight categories committee starts getting bombarded bombarded and I was sitting I was sitting between him and Janat who's the, the representative from Kazakhstan. So I'm sitting next to Niku, and the whole first day, he's just sitting there writing numbers. And we come from dinner, and he's in the lobby, and he's writing numbers. And I went up just fucking with him. I was like, God damn, are you still fucking writing numbers? You've just been writing numbers. all. He's like, we have to get this right. We have to get this right. And I was like, what about what the working group did? But everybody was coming in with their own suggestions. To such to the point that we actually received this uh, these Q, this body weight category working group information a couple of days before we all flew out to Tashkent, and then we had the hard copy when we got there. Right after we got this working group's recommendations, the, the uh, IWF body weight category working group, we got another suggestion that came from two Thais, an Iraqi, and, and, a, and a guy from Indonesia, and I won't say their names. Uh, one of which is on the executive board. So we had this counter proposal that came in from an independent group, one of which is on the executive board, and uh, several from uh, another from Asia and two representative, two more representatives from Asia and one from the Middle East. And they, the problem with this recommendation was that they only gave Olympic categories. They didn't give the ten. Uh, categories otherwise and their idea was that let's pick Olympic categories first and then we'll go and fill in the gaps um, but because the Olympic categories aren't the primary categories because those could change from Olympics to Olympics um, well and that's also one competition every four years versus right. a shitload every year it makes so no for sense me, for those to be primary yeah, right so for me the methodology that the working group took was a little bit more it was more comprehensive and understood that that this is just for um, and they did ranking lists and other things to look at what the, the and numbers of participants and things like that. So they did some work that would have, and it, and it shows you exactly what I was explaining that we were talking about earlier about the lack of higher number of competitors in the heavier weight classes. Um, I mean, we, they, they did this average the mean of women weightlifters from 2012 to 2017 in the categories from 48 to 75 plus. 150 in the 48s, 147 in the 53s, 155 in the 58s, 153s in the 63s, 130 in the 69s, 103 in the 75s, 115s in the 75 plus. Right? So, I mean, just looking at this, the va I mean, there's a 20 drop in the average of participants, and then an, uh, another 27 drop. Uh, there's 23 between the 63s and 69s and the average of competitors from 2012 to 2017 in those categories. It drops another 27 to the 75s and then it bumps up like 12 for the 75 plus. You're looking at the total of, of two classes in the middleweights exceed the last three classes combined. And so that's a clear indication that you need to have more middleweight categories than heavy categories. That's why this boggles my mind, that we were prepared to put into the Olympics 
three heavyweight categories. So in the fight that ensued, or our discussion, sorry, you said word. <laughs> but the discussion that ensued with the executive board, um, none of them, none of the proposals that ended up getting voted on actually looked exactly like either one of these because they had all been amended and um, it was, uh, so the rest of this proposal went through and gave them kind of seeing if there's anything else of any real note. Um, so you had then this counter group that was trying to come up with their own proposal and wasn't accepting of what was given in the, in the body weight categories group. And I think they were obviously prepared to come in with something else. Um, they had, oh, damn, on this front page they have the history. I could have looked at. So just to help you back with that history, uh, 1920 uh, to 1992 is when those first classes that I mentioned were utilized. So 1920 and then adding the women in, it says 1988, but that's not true because we competed outside of international competition and had women's categories, so we used those. 93 to 97, we had categories. 98 to 2018, we had the most recent categories. So those were the ones that they listed in terms of history of weight classes. I don't know what was happening before 1920, um, and I probably never will. Anyway, so they gave us their advice for classes, and they looked different than the advice we had. They were starting women with 49, 55, 62, 70, 79, 89, 89 plus, and that's what they had proposed for the for the Olympics. And again, no proposal for the actual uh, world championships or otherwise. The men they proposed 58, 67, 76, 86, 98, 111, 111 plus. So they went down in the supers compared to what the other. Um, uh, suggestion was which would have gone at 118 um, which is no surprise when you're dealing with um, the Asians that they're going to say okay uh, we're not going to go as heavy because they don't usually have a lot of heavyweights but uh, in the Middle East we do see a lot of more heavyweights of note um, but they didn't give us again any kind of the top the 10 categories that they had, were suggesting. And they didn't, other than providing means or averages and participation, which then they really didn't even abide by because you still had 70, 79, 89, 89 plus. You still had four classes over 70 when in 79s, 89, 89 plus, you know those three categories together will have less in them, all three, than the 55s and 62s combined for the women if you had those classes just by sheer numbers. So they were really thinning it out at the end instead of trying to thin out the middle. So that was my biggest grievance with everything is that none of it really ever addressed the density of the of the of the people in the middle and create more categories there, which was to me the most logical thing to do. Of course it so is. It, it's it's yeah. it's the a statistics of freaking human beings. Like there are now, always more in the middle. Greg, it's a bell curve, so you know, and it needs I to address that. In the meeting, out loud, as I said, look at the statistical data. Statistics and data don't matter. Fake news. <laughs> At which point I didn't. I laughed because I didn't know. At which point I shit my pants and left the room. <laughs> yeah. I, because what? clearly I was not needed. <laughs> I looked puzzled. I felt puzzled, and I was like, "What am I working with?" But in any case, the categories that we ended up with were none of these exactly that I have. Uh, um, announced to you, you know which, what they are because you have them. Uh, we've all posted them and everybody's seen them. But, um, yeah, it was, it turned out that there was all sorts of rewriting and in a very, I think, political way uh, agreements were made. So when we were at, did the actual vote, they basically would give us a, a, a list of one set of classes for the men, for the ten, and then the women, and then we would vote you know, A or B, do you want this line or this line? We lost, and I say we, the group that, the kind of little coalition that was voting um, based on statistical data, lost every vote except the very last vote. <laughs> and the very last vote that we did win, because I wanted, I, I didn't see like 45 as a good place to start the women. I thought 47 was a good place to start the women. Um, and of course we ended up with a 45 kilo class uh, but in any case the one thing that I uh, um, 
did really like lose my mind on was they wanted to pull the 59 women's class out for the Olympics and leave in four of the heavyweight classes, which we ended up pulling out. What did we end up pulling out? Um, 76. We ended up pulling out the 76. No, where are we at? No, the 71 and the 81. And we otherwise would have had 76, 81, 87, 87. It would have jumped 6, 64 uh, to there. And then it would have been 64, uh, 55, and 49. And that would have been it. Now that would have been uh, the seven. So we would have um, had 76, 81, 87, 87 plus. We would have lost the 71s and the 59s and the 45s. 45 is fine. I think everybody agreed to pull that out. But it was really then a fight between keeping the 71s or keeping the 59s. And not because I'm a 59, but, or was, because I'm not anymore. Now I'm probably a 71. Um, but, I mean, granted, I'm not going to the Olympics as a 59 or 71. So it had nothing to do with me. It definitely had nothing to do with American weightlifting because I'm there to try to suit many classes long term, not just for American weightlifting right now. If I was making that decision based on personal interest, I would have left in all those heavies and took out the 59s. But the fact is, and the statistical data that matters to no one apparently, there are far more women in that 55 to 64 range than there are women in the 76 plus range. Of course there are. 71, it's the same for men. It's human beings. <laughs> like It's so not that crazy. I, the only vote we won was that, that, that I was successful in being on the winning side and the vote was to keep the women's 59s as an Olympic category. And it may not benefit us right now, but the fact is we have had a, a history of very strong 59s and um, I think we can again. And the other thing is the, the 59 class is a fucking stacked class. Right. And so internationally. And so really you just statistic, you know, like the spread of people tell us that we needed the 59, not another, you know, class in the mid 70s, even though I would have, you know, obviously for our purposes, uh, keeping that 71 would have been beneficial. Um, it's one of the times that you have to make a decision. One of the times that I had to make a decision that was based on international weightlifting, uh, a good decision based on international weightlifting, not just what America wants, because that was the problem that everybody else was going in and trying to move maneuver these based on what their country wants. And had we not done that, we would have ended up with a very good set of numbers from this working group. Instead, we ended up with a set of numbers that hardly make any sense <laughs> because they are m numbers that made sense with a lot of political maneuvering and attached to them. And that's just too bad. That's how you end up with a 45 kilo class and potentially a 59 that's not in the Olympics. Now that, you know, pulling out the... Uh, the 96s was the other question for the Olympics. Do we go by what the IOC says and risk them pulling the 96 class and then turning around and pulling out a women's class? Because they could very easily say, hey, we told you don't duplicate the 94s and here's this 96. We're just going to take it out for you because you could not take it out. And so um, I had actually voted to keep the 89s and pull out the 96s. And I know that that wasn't premised on anything other than it's what the IOC had suggested. And so, um, because obviously the men's 96 is very competitive. But they, the, we lost that vote, so they put it in. So that kind of scares me a little bit because I feel like they could come back if they wanted to uh, with pretty good rationale and say, okay, we're going to further reduce you to six and six. But it was a majority vote, and that's the way the ball bounces. Um, so that was, uh, again, an, another vote that the only vote that we won was to keep the women's 59. And uh, I, feel, I felt like at that point they were just making a concession because I was losing my shit. So anyway, folks, that's and Ursula's short Ursula version of the story. Jump out of a window that she can't open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the ultimate point of all of this is that this is what the weight classes are now. 
Yeah. If you don't like it, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. It doesn't matter. You have to lift in one of them. So I don't like them all necessarily. I think some of the decisions that were made were stupid, uh, especially with regard to the Olympic classes. But you know what? This is what they are. Just like it was what they are before this decision. You know, if you don't like yeah, it, you don't yeah, get to yeah, protest and create your own. Nobody thinks so about it. Suck it up. Sport and the classes are already there. People only think about it when there's a chance that they might be able to change it to make it something ideal for them. Yeah. <laughs> of course. So, Gwen, there's the, there's your uh, answer. There's a hundred times more than you ever wanted to know about that. And that's. Uh, <laughs> It is now we are where we're at, and that's it. And Greg told me to make it short, and I did not. And I have to go to the doctor. Oh, everyone else does too, because their ears are bleeding. <laughs> All right, guys. Let's. Now has to go to the doctor for their migraines. Well, yeah, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, again, if you have questions, catalystathletics.com slash podcast. Please leave a review if you get a chance. Uh, share with your friends, your family, your grandmothers. We'll love this show. Uh, and it will really provide them the experience of uh, new and exciting profanity. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you want to... Specifically applied to weightlifting. R- right. Yeah. It's always good to have new experiences. Okay. See you next time. No, uh, no, no. Not what do you mean no? I, I have Art of Coaching Weightlifting in San Diego. Okay. Didn't um, I give you a chance at the beginning to talk and you just didn't even want to? Oh, No. Yeah. Uh, oh yes, right. That's when you permitted me to talk. I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, Get the 20, fuck over the yourself. And the twenty sixth in San Diego, uh, I'll be at a ballad sleep uh, training, and it's, it's it's on my website at weightliftingwise dot com. And so, if you're in the California area or the SoCal area, and you're interested in learning a whole lot about coaching weightlifting, I'll be there teaching a whole lot about. Uh, and answering any question you want in a very long-winded way. I was going to say, any question you want, but she'll only have time for two (laughs) the whole weekend. So choose carefully. Fucking anything. Uh, All right, guys, seriously, though, thank you for listening. Thank you for um, enduring our ridiculous breaks between episodes. Uh, I'm back for like a month. So we can be on track for like Uh, at least two weeks. I was going to say, that's literally two episodes, Ursula. (laughs) Well, I can promise that. (laughs) Careful what you, careful what you promise. Okay, guys, it's been fun. Talk to you at some point in the unspecified near future. Hopefully if we don't quit. Yeah. Keep listening and go put good remarks about us. Even if you don't feel that way. (laughs) Grit your teeth and lie if you have to. (laughs) Okay. Bye. Uh, Okay. Bye.